making movies is the closest equivalent I can think of to running away and joining the circus. In the 19th century, that was probably the, what a kid would do. In the 20th century, he ran away and said, I'm going to make movies. It sure beat working. Art thrives on restrictions and on things left out. Paintings do not move. Music has no image. It is, in every case, the imaginative participation of the reader, the viewer, the auditor that completes the circle that makes it art. Movies have a tendency to do everything for you, too much. Uh, they can tell you where to look. They can tell you what to hear. So as a director, I'm always curious at things that, are, that movies manage to leave to the imagination, which is my whole point about how art is supposed to work, and movies have a difficult time with that. But one of the things that they do very well is to let you look at faces and to, to infer uh, emotion, intellectual process. I personally would rather work with a smart actor than a dumb actor. And we might as well spend a minute and talk about the fact that actors who look smart don't nece aren't necessarily smart, and actors who look dumb aren't necessarily dumb. It's, it's, there's very little correlation. There is some correlation between actors who can look like they're thinking and actors who don't look like they're thinking. Um, actors where you can see the wheels going around. Doesn't necessarily mean there are any wheels going around, by the way, but that's not essential. What's essential is that you believe that things are taking place. Some actors are better on take one, and some are better on take 10. Some feel their way toward where they're going in take after take, and some nail it with a certain spontaneity right off the bat. With Bill, Bill got better the more you did it. Because I think there was always a temptation or an instinct, I don't even think he thought about it, to play it with a certain attitude. I'm Captain Kirk, I'm the hero, I'm the main guy. I found that the more you did it, he would become sort of bored with striking those postures, and eventually he would just deliver it. He would just behave. Somebody said that acting on film is a lot about behavior. So I would just do it until he stopped reflexively projecting an image and just started being and get him in the moment. I was hard for him. DeForest Kelly would do it naturally. He would just say it. My involvement with Star Trek uh, begins with my non-involvement, which is to say I had never seen it. I had never seen it on television. When I was at uh, college, I knew a guy who used to watch it every day. He used to drop acid and watch it every day. For 54 days, he dropped acid and watched. He was a PhD candidate in American studies. And uh, at the end of the 54th day, his wife left him. That's what I remembered about it. Uh, I had a friend, I still have a friend, whose name is Karen Moore. She was an executive at Paramount. And uh, after my first movie, Time After Time, I, there was a movie I very much wanted to make based on a novel by the Canadian Robertson Davies. I couldn't get this going for love or money, and years were passing by, and she finally said to me, you know, if you want to learn how to be a director, you should direct, you shouldn't be sitting up here sulking in your house. If my mother had said that to me, I, I, I think I would have punched her out, but since it was somebody who wasn't my mother, just a, a, quote, disinterested friend. I listened when she said, why don't you go down and meet Harv Bennett at Paramount and hear about the Star Trek movie that he's in charge of making. And I said, is the one with the guy with pointy ears? She said, that's the one. So really, not having anything better to do, I went down and met Harv, and I liked him a lot. 
And they showed me the first Star Trek movie, and they showed me some of the episodes. And once I sort of got the Horatio Hornblower of it all in outer space, and it was right after, or more or less after, uh, Star Wars had come out, and the whole idea of doing a, a space opera was suddenly very appealing, and the idea of having a massive symphony orchestral accompaniment to it. So that's how I got involved uh, in the first one, uh, in, uh, which was titled by the studio in its infinite wisdom, The Wrath of Khan. Uh, it was originally called, when I wrote it, The Undiscovered Country. And then uh, after that came out and was successful, they asked if I wanted to work on the next one, which was basically the resurrection of Spock. And when I had made Star Trek II, I thought Spock was dead. And I think everybody making the movie thought he was dead. When he was dying in his big scene with Kirk, there were people standing around the soundstage in tears. So it was very, it was very final to us. It was too final to me to come back and bring him back. Uh, so resurrections are beyond my, they're out of my bailiwick. So I didn't. I was brought back on four somewhat under emergency circumstances. Uh, they had to start shooting, and they didn't have a script, and Harv and I divided up the story that he and Leonard had cooked up, and very, very fast, which I sometimes think is the way to make movies. Uh, it's short order cooking. If you keep on writing and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting, you, all the juice goes. But this was great, because we just like wrote it and shot it, and it has a certain spontaneity um, that I think movies, Hollywood movies lately, bigger and bigger budgets, maybe they don't have that. Star Trek, and I've said this before, seems a lot to me like the Catholic Mass, which is to say the words are familiar, the words do not change. It's the music that changes, and whether it's the Carnation, uh, Carnation Mass of Mozart, the Verdi Requiem, the Haydn Mass in Time of War, the Bach B minor Mass. Um, the music is so different that they scarcely occur to you as being the same um, text. So every writer and every director who comes aboard to do an episode or a movie of Star Trek is bringing to it, uh, literally as well as, and more importantly, figuratively, his own stamp, his own personality, his own music. The music of my Star Treks 2, 4, and 6, the horn blower of it all, the, they're more earthbound than some of the others. I don't mean that they take place on Earth. I mean that they're reference to earthly events for, as opposed to supernatural or scientifically inexplicable events. The Genesis planet, I suppose, is pretty inexplicable, but otherwise it's a pretty it it's all revolves very heavily around human behavior. The best line I ever heard about this business, which is probably about the business of being an artist, was said to me by a 16-year-old actress. That actress was Jennifer Grey. And she said, if only when it was good, it wasn't so good. And I think that's why people stay hang around movies because they think oh, if only when it was good it wasn't so good if it wasn't so good we'd walk away and do something else and be grown-ups <laughs>